Earl Horn A, repeat offender. How's it going? <laughs> uh, I think this is third time is a charm. It is. <laughs> Do you know what as well? Rocked up and I thought he might have lost his uh, marbles. Open the door and he's talking to your cat. <laughs> no Problem was, the cat was talking to me and it just yeah. felt rude. He's like, what's your name? I said, I'm going to haunt it. He goes, where'd you come from? I said, oh, all over the place. Now he won't let <laughs> us. And now he's sitting outside the door going, wow. <laughs> followed you. Pussy magnet. Let's though. see your skills. We have a skills test now. Oh. See if you, down to your left there, we have a mask. Grab that mask. Oh, am I supposed to scare the cat? No, <laughs> no, it will. But, and um, before you put it on. Have a look to your left and grab that E out of Reapers. The other one. Actually, yeah, go that <laughs> no, one. No, 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 the other one. Yeah. yeah that's the one. Pull it off. Yeah, off. Yeah. It's blue tacked on. Right, We're high okay. tech here. Okay. Now I'm, mask yourself. Oh, fuck, I've got to put it back on. And now you have to have a stab in the dark. I forgot, are we allowed to swear? Yeah, of course we are. Because I, I specialise in swear. <laughs> so the last guest that had this was Jack Della and he went horribly. So you've got to try. Just push it on. You've got to do one firm push. No I adjusting. can't actually see at all. Oh, my God. Oh. You're a gun. That's mm. almost like fucking uh, easy tiger. <laughs> oh, that's that's impressive. where it stays. <laughs> I'll pay that. He's he's a front runner, eh? He is. I can, shall I adjust? No, or? no, okay, you leave no, it. We'll leave it we did a whole pod where it said Grin Rapids. <laughs> Fair play. I like it. Some... That's probably telling us a little bit more about Jack's dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Good to have you back, El Hornet. It's been a while. Um, I was just refreshing on the last two that we did and uh, both were sort of the start of traumatic periods and middle of traumatic periods in terms of COVID and life and travel and stuff. And, yeah, now I feel like we're, the, we're the other side of that. We and, are. Uh, the clouds have parted and the future's looking bright, finally. So happy days. I was thinking the same thing. I was mm. like, we've been through the, you know, the start phase, middle phase, and now we're out of it. And for you, you're obviously affected by it a lot. Like Now you're back to normality, aren't you? You've been traveling the world regularly. Well, it was, it was pretty cool that um, suddenly March 22 it was like, gigs are back. You can travel. By the way... Travel costs four times as much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like, shit. So all those flights back to Europe, um, I, mean, I think I used to spend about – I was quite lucky. We were touring, so we used it as an expense. So I was flying – every time I'd come to Australia, which is like a couple times a year, I'd pay about six grand for a business flight, and I paid $9,800 for an economy seat on Emirates. I think it was in September. <laughs> and I was like, yep. I'm not making any money still. So, yeah, it's, it was bittersweet, but uh, I did some cool gigs this year already. I did New Year's in New Zealand. Uh, flew back three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Pendulum did a big headline show at a venue called Alexander Palace in North London, which is kind of trippy because it's at the end of the street where I lived for 17 years. So um, I've been back in Australia now for three years, nearly three years. And, yeah, suddenly it's like you're back, off you go. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of wild. Just a little far from everything here. I was used to those little 20-pound, two-hour hops over to Europe, and now they're a 22-hour, seven-grand hop from Perth. So, 7K. So, yeah, my I think average spend I'm hitting now on uh, economy flights is still minimum of four grand. Oh. Also, something that's changed as well, because uh, during COVID we lost a lot of promoters and venues all closed and everyone was a bit sort of up shit creek. Now, instead of booking out gigs for a year in advance, I get stuff turned up in three weeks and they're like, <laughs> you ready to go? And I'm like, oh, shit, I don't know. Yeah, I'm in the Lancelot. <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. Like I've been down in Denmark just hanging and it's like, can you go to Spain and do a gig in 10 days? And the promoters have sat there and gone, we have money, let's do the gig right now, and it's on. Whereas before it would be like, pretty planned out there's the cat at the door going wow <laughs> that's our promoter it's like we got another gig <laughs> <laughs> but yeah tough industry man like uh, I speak to a lot of people who aren't in the music industry who are almost a little oblivious of what it was like for the creative industries and they're like what do you mean we just worked I was like yeah well fucking that's nice isn't it you know if you're in a trade where you were busier than normal or maybe things were a little bit harder maybe you're a little bit uh unaware of what was going on with people that were traveling for work and you know it was it was a wild time so i guess the last time we talked i was just cooling out in west i was burning my savings thinking my life's over <laughs> <laughs> how do you find the um has it been grinding away a bit like it's take its toll being located back here uh, and now that the music industry's opened up is it for you find it tough kind of coming back those long slogs i'm kind of liking it to be honest uh i've got a couple of small kids and 
sitting on a plane for 20 hours just like, oh, this is nice. <laughs> it's just me by myself. If they're not next to you, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> pre- precisely if I'm not having to fly with them. Like my little fel- – my, sorry, my biggest kid, uh, we went from London to Perth and back four times in his first year of life. And Holy I was like, smokes. This sucks. So, yeah, it's a little bit um, strange leaving WA because I didn't leave for two years and that was the longest time in 20 years that I never went anywhere. So suddenly you're finding yourself just not travelling at all when you're used to going to two countries a week. That was a head fuck. So. But, you know, I think I'm pretty, um, I'm pretty honest with you boys and I'm pretty honest with most people about, like, life and, uh, you know, some people hide their personal things but, like, I went through a gnarly divorce which is ongoing and career was in the toilet I had a newborn so it's just like a series of mental things and um for the probably for the first time in my life I really understood the pressures that a lot of men go through in these situations and it started to make sense why people take drastic measures like I've, I've lost a lot of mates uh I think a lot more than a lot of people I've lost a lot of mates to suicide like in the last 20 years like I stopped counting and and just hectic deaths and stuff, you know, stuff that probably could have been avoided. And uh, for the first time ever, as a f- really mentally resilient person, I was like, fuck, I see this now. Yeah. I'm going to drive into a tree. <laughs> like, I just got it, you know, it just clicked. It was like... It's like people can be low and then another thing hits them, then another thing, hey, exactly. and they just they just can't see a way out. Yeah, and the last time I felt like that was in the 90s. Like, I kept, I was, I was a kid and... I kept getting fired. My car got nicked. I got kicked out of this share house. I was technically homeless for a bit. And I was like, that was the only time in my life I'd ever personally been depressed. And, you know, you forget that the black dog exists and some people have to deal with that on a daily. So suddenly I'm faced with like end of career, end of marriage, new baby on top, living somewhere I really didn't feel at home because I'd been gone for so long. And I was like, oh, wow, this is fucked. Yeah. How do I climb out of this? And I think, you know, the end of relationships can be a smooth thing or it can be a a turbulent thing. And if you've got kids in the mix, it just feels like something you just can't get away from. You're just tied to this person who in your eyes, you know, someone that you loved that now you're just like, this person's just trying to fuck me up. And, you know, you've got financial responsibilities and you've got parenting responsibilities and it's like, I went through all of that, so... Come out on the other side now and uh, feeling pretty good. But what um, tools did you use and that, like how can you help people that might be good. in a similar situation? Yeah, surfing was super good. Just uh, anything physical. Like I got a bit fat, I don't know, 20 years ago and stayed there. Not, I'm not exactly fat but I'm a big fella and I think I started riding BMX again down in uh, Alexander Drive, this little pump track. I was whipping around <laughs> that. It was funny because I ran into some, some a couple of dads from my school and I thought I was fat and then I saw them and I was like, I'm sweet ass. <laughs> You're moderate. And, and they're, they're there pushing their kids around who are falling over and crying. I'm like, why don't you get a bike, jump on and whip around the track with your kid? Oh, no, I can't do that. I'm like, well, you suck because I'm doing it. And they were like, we can't believe that you're 40, forgot how old I am, 46. Still riding BMX just around the track. And I was like, well, I can't believe you're not because yeah. you can. So that helped. I uh, started skating a bit. That helped. Uh, and then touring opening up helped as well because that was the, that was the biggest thing um, that I wasn't used to. It was just not going anywhere and not being so upperly mobile. And, but, yeah, did a lot of surfing, got a new girlfriend. She's great. All the things that uh, you want in life suddenly start to align and you're like, oh, this is wicked. So. People lose that play, don't they? Yeah. As they get older. And like I think it's important, like not only physically you like would notice the benefits, mm. you lose weight by getting on the bike more or doing just active stuff you used to do growing up. But mentally it's massive. Yeah. It goes hand in hand. I always man. talk about was it Jewel that was on Rogan and she talked about how she was on a beach once and she saw the tide coming in and out and mm. it just kind of occurred to her that it's like a simile for life where you could be in a bad patch but eventually the tide's gonna sort of Change? Are you yeah. talking about the singer, Jewel? Yeah. Oh, a friend of mine was her tour manager. She's act- Actually, her tour manager was from Perth. No. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Was it Jewel? Yeah. That was well, on Rogan? Yeah, 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 Jewel, yeah. I had such a thing for that chick. She was so smoking hot. You should have, have you heard her pod on nah, Rogan? Man, it's such it. a good listen. Okay. You, like, if you already like her, you'd love her even have more. You, have, you, have you met her? No. Through too many, yeah. no. She had a wild life. She had a fucking... The way her career kicked off, she was... Yeah. It's, it was kind of like zero to a million, wasn't it? Like, bang, go. Ish, but she... Yeah, yeah. she 
doubled down on herself. Like it's a real good story. She went through everything. Didn't yeah, she? and she lived like her her parents or grandparents abusive or something. Yeah, they like walked through America, like Alaska, was it? Yeah, yeah. And, like set up butchering like, her story, but yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, you love it. You're thinking, you know, a lot of people. You talk about how you went through those sort of rougher times. Um, it seems to be when you have chats with people that have gone through similar circumstances. Sometimes it just pops up out of nowhere, or they think it does like i know someone now who's close to me who's like it, you wouldn't have picked up on it and it's mm. just all came in avalanche a couple of weekends ago and everyone's like kind of in shock with like they open up about that they're having some struggles yeah but you're kind of like well fuck i did not pick up on it at all and i don't think they did maybe they suppressed it and then it just that's the problem we don't talk about it on a saturday afternoon it just <clears throat> all comes to a yeah spills out like, is that and Have it's this heard- misconception if you see someone that's popular or famous, you think they're above being depressed or something, but it's every person is the same, essentially. Yeah. They have the same problems. and It's interesting because it's something that I, I felt like the touring life made me incredibly resilient to a lot of things. Like some of the... I call them fuckeries. Some of the fuckeries that we have survived out there in the wilderness <laughs> trying to just play gigs and just get places and travel and, you know, just the stories. I should probably write a book before I forget all this shit. Uh, I think that made me incredibly strong mentally and then, you know, having things like a, a newborn, I was like, this is a walk in the park. I can sleep four hours a night, no worries. But my ex couldn't and some people can't. And so I looked at that and I was like, I could see how this would send people around the twist. <laughs> When you're talking about like postpartum depression for females and then, you know, that being projected onto their partners and then you're in this situation where you middle of winter, you got a newborn, you're just sitting there like I was down in Falcon, it's pissing with rain and howling with wind. I've got this newborn, my I'm breaking up with my wife. I'm just like, What the fuck? <laughs> What's next, world? You know, what do you got? And I think I looked at it as like a I don't know, kind of like Jenga, like take all the bits away and see what I'm left with and see if I can survive. And that's how it felt. Um, And I think until you get personally uh, sort of forced to deal with that, you don't really know how to help people or how to talk to people about it if someone just comes out and says, I'm having some dramas. And I still now go, what do I do? If someone says I'm really struggling with my mental health this week, well, generationally that wasn't a statement that, people from my era ever said because you didn't talk about that and if you did talk about it it'd be like well just fucking harden up you know and i feel like thankfully we've moved past a place in society for the most part where you can say those things out loud and people are a little bit mindful of the fact that that's just the same as i've broken my leg the sympathy should be on par if not even more because the the reactions of some people when they're in that place has got to be can be quite detrimental to their lives and like I, you know, I've had friends who have just shot themselves just cause. Why? I don't know. Didn't talk to anyone about it. Yeah. So when people talk about it now, I'm like, rather than brush it off, like we scroll on Instagram with our friendships, and someone says something, I find myself just pulling the handbrake and stopping and going, shit, someone's come out and said I'm not doing good. Uh, if I'm friends with them more than just acquaintances or just knowing them, I should really stop what I'm doing and maybe put a bit of effort into this. Reach out. Reach out and say, you know, even if it's just on Messenger, because fuck, who calls anyone these days? Like I didn't get, like when I split with my ex and we were, and you know, we just went through the mediation like last week, I didn't get a single phone call from a single person. Oh, one person who's, you know, a mate for 25 years is like, you good? This is pretty hectic what you're going through. And I was like, you're the only one who's actually noticed. So I think, yeah, communication is key, isn't it? Yeah. If you say that you're mates with someone enough to add them to your bloody Facebook or follow them on Instagram, shoot them an inbox and say, you cool? Yeah. Because, yeah, we all go through some hectic things. And I know we're all busy, but there's there's times where you, where just that conversation could make the difference between someone doing something drastic and someone getting past that day or that week or that month or that year. Yeah. Just got to get them out of like someone that's depressed or if you have a friend, just get them out of that like laying in bed in a room where they're just sort of going more inwards and get yeah. them out into fresh air, whether it's a hike or whatever. And another thing I know that works so well is um, even if you've just got a hangover and you're feeling shit, you do breath work. Yeah. There's uh, Louis does this, it's almost like hypertrophic breathing or whatever, but man, you do that for 10 minutes and you, you it f- physically, your body just elevates and you just feel instantly mentally better, physically better. And that's just through like a few breathing techniques. Mm. So 
That's I know why someone I guess- that does that up in Scarborough and does and sound healing and stuff. And as a muser, I'm like. Pfft. If I want sound healing, I'll go to a rave and listen to drum and bass for five hours. <laughs> like, <laughs> that heals me perfectly. But have if, you ever you know, d- tried a series of breath work? Uh, no, but my my partner now is um, quite holistic, so she's always trying to get me down that path, and I'm very resistant to it. But Dude, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting better at it. Yeah, because you just like as you go through life, you forget to like breathe <laughs> into your belly, and you just well, breathe into your chest. Yeah, if you ever sing, you know they like sing from your gut. Yeah, and and I'll sit there and do a. I, I suck at singing. That's why I don't sing in pendulum. <laughs> and I'll do a raspy little uh, little harmony vocal, and someone will look at me and I'll be like, Oh God, okay. All the importance is in your core. But yeah, man, relationships can trip you out sometimes uh, as we get older and uh, the consequences of these things get more intense when there's children and mortgages and savings accounts and stuff. It just makes me wish for the days when we're in high school and you'd walk up to your girlfriend and go, you're dropped. Yeah. <laughs> and that was that. Yeah. <laughs> Stay back to Scarborough. You're, like, See you later. <laughs> you're dropped. What's next on the menu? Yeah. Life was so sweet. Do you um, reckon um, there was a lot of change and I guess stalling in your life at that time as well in regards to like, you had a lot of change, one factor, but also you weren't, it was suppressed what you could do. Like you weren't able to travel and yeah. perform. Did you find now, now the I are able to perform, you realize, I guess, how much you love that, and how much that's you? Like- yeah, for sure. In 2019, I was dead set ready to retire. I was so over it. Uh, Pendulum had been going for 17 years since the very, very, very start. And I was like, fuck, man, I'm just, I'm on Groundhog Day. Every gig, every flight. It's all the same stuff. I've done these places before. I'm traveling to countries I've just been to five times I didn't like the first time. And everyone's like, oh, your life is so good. I'm like, yeah, come with. Come with for a weekend and do six flights and don't sleep for three days and tell me how fantastic (laughs) this is. And I think uh, I got to a point where I was just like, I'm not appreciating this. All I want to do is be back in WA. I'd been gone since 2003. All I want to do is just walk down Scarborough, drive down south, just do all the things that I forgot about, like – in the in the sort of middle of my career and then it got taken away and then six months in you're like oh man that was so good those <laughs> yeah. shitty cut price airline flights and i miss plain food you know just the, dumb, just, just the dumbest stuff i can relate to that big yeah. time with tension <clears throat> like yeah you going through doing so many movies traveling and all that i, I remember the same sort of feeling mm. i just want to go on a trip where i don't have to carry tripod and cameras and be thinking of what content i need to create or capture yeah. and just chill for sure. but then you chill for a bit and then you start missing it i eh? can't do holidays bro if i'm not <laughs> doing a gig that coincides with an extra day or five after it i can't do it i just can't go somewhere on holidays i need to have a purpose yeah. attached to it like um I was looking through some photos and stuff and I was thinking, because Coachella is next month and I'm actually going to be driving past Palm Springs in India and California where Coachella is the weekend it's on. I'm like, shit, maybe I should go because we played that festival three times. And I thought to myself, you know, I never went out there just for a, for a funsies. We always did a gig and then stayed on. Yeah. What um, is that you reckon that makes you not be able to holiday? Is it because you uh, don't want to relax? The, I you, want the gift you have to pay doing, for it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> You have to be doing something. I've got to be doing something. I can't just like, I mean, Bali's one thing. I could go Bali and sit around for a while. Um, but then I'd be walking through Kuda, if you do, or wherever, and I'd be looking at the clubs going, fuck, I should be playing there. <laughs> but I reckon that comes down to not that you have to be doing something. I think it's like you actually just love doing it. And you yeah, put it exactly. side to side where it's like, that reward of a break, but then knowing, oh, I get to fucking do what I love tonight. Yeah, that's, that, the, that's the best bit. Anything, too much of anything becomes like f- you become flat and yeah. over it, but then you recharge. But it's definitely saying it's the love of it because you didn't love doing it. Like if you fucking hate doing housework, you're not on holiday going, can't wait to fucking do housework tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's because you love, you do love carrying the tripods in a way of like getting the content and filming. Yeah. Good waves. It's a blend, eh? Being busy, but also have time to chill. Mm. Yeah, and I you think love just, that performing, you probably get that itch. Yeah, I mean, like, there's some people in the music industry who DJ or, you know, perform live or whatever who I think they look at it as a monetary necessity but a bit of an inconvenience because it takes them out of their studio and they just want to be in the studio making music. But no one makes money from just making music. You've got you to perform. Whereas I came from performing first. So I was like, if I walk past a club and the DJ's playing – even after 20 years and all of our success, I'm just like, 
I want to kick that fucking dude off. I want to have a spin. <laughs> That's the love of it. Eh? I'm going to rinse it. This guy's terrible. Yeah. And even if I'm in Cooter walking past the bounty or wherever, I'd be like, man, this club's full of jerks. I'm, I'm sure I could tear it up though. And that's weird because I thought that would go away. And I thought I'd get old and my hair would turn grey and I'd be like, oh, those kids can have their fun. And I'm like, nah, I still want to be the dude up there like controlling, which is such a bizarre feeling. So, yeah, on holidays I'm even walking past little bars in Seminyak being like, I wonder if they let me jump on. That's so <laughs> sick though. And that's what um, happened when Chili Peppers were here recently. Chad, Chad Smith, the drummer, is it uh, Chad Smith? Chad Canning. Chad Canning. He, yeah. Chad Smith is like a um, fake name you give a train cop. Hey? Yeah. <laughs> but he, he um, the Will Farrell looked like he rocked up to – Dane Warren and a few of the boys. Um, oh, yeah, he did a couple of things yeah, like that. Yeah, he rocked up. They, they were playing, and then I think there was a Chili Peppers cover band playing, <laughs> and he just rocked up to um, like a random pub in Perth and mm. just watched the local scene. How, and they were all funny. fucking out. They're like, what the fuck? Yeah, they went down. I think, so it was, I think it was them that went down to the hen house. Uh, remember um, the band Gyroscope? Uh, the original drummer, Rob, owns a rehearsal studio in Aussie Park called the Hen House. And. Uh, they had like Guns N' Roses turn up and jam down there. Like those dudes don't need to do that. <laughs> yeah. Like why does Duff McKagan need to go practice bass guitar? He fucking yeah. doesn't. Like play it with one finger, he knows every song. But they're like, they're lifers, you know. Like they don't do this because it's like just a job. Uh, but then there's a lot of people that do just do it because it's a job. And I see that straight away. I see through them. And I'm like, you're a corporate musician who's like maybe come through music school and going, how can I make money out of this? I'll make dance music. And I see them straight away. And then I see guys who are like, I remember you from the dance floor, like cooked in the corner, just like feeling the music and going mental. And now you're a producer and there's different levels of that. So yeah. when I see dudes, like Rob put up on their socials, you know, they had, I think some of the dudes from the Peppers went down there as well. He's like, yeah, we had Guns N' Roses in today. And I was like, that's fucking sick. Yeah. Those dudes after 30 years or 40 years or however long, Still just out there vibing. Chad Canning watching local cover bands. How, how weird cool is that? How weird would it be though watching a cover band of your band? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How like, nervous should you be? You're like, oh, this is, oh, the musos must I'm have been the boss. bugging out. <laughs> His like, name's Chad Smith. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd just be inclined to like walk up and be like, bro, can we sub out your drummer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, can I have a go? I was thinking um, when I, when Dane was telling me that, I was like, that's so cool. But one bit of it surprised me, then another bit didn't because. When we were in America recently, we went to like Whiskey and Go Go and oh, like the Troubadour yeah. and all that. <clears throat> and I knew, didn't know much about the history yeah. to the level that I got to know it. Down and on like, strip, they, yeah. they, that's their vibe, eh? Like they were, that was their sort of scene. Like they were forever in that punk scene and, mm. and the LA rock and roll scene. And that's how they all had their come up. So you wouldn't lose that. Too many guys you'd hope wouldn't lose. Remember where they came from? Yeah. Those you'd hope so. Of, like, Chili Peppers and Guns N' Roses. And- you'd hope so because. A lot of those bands came from scene. Yeah. They didn't just come from record deal. Like, like nowadays I find a lot of people sidestep their local scene or sidestep any scene and they're straight on to streaming platforms or they're straight on tour. And I think the DIY aspect, especially in Perth, of the punk scene, the hardcore scene, the rave scene, the drum and bass scene, that was so important for me for perspective like I played at the Hyde Park Hotel to four people. Like my band used to play at the White Sands in Scarborough and the only people in the audience were the other bands. But we did that for years and it wasn't because we thought that there was a like a trajectory that we could see ourselves getting famous from. It's because we were just into the scene. And yeah. that's, that's hell important for me and super not important for a lot of dudes and that's fine. But I was always about like building my local thing. Like the punk rock scene in Perth was so good. Um, if we're talking early tension days, you know, I'm talking about bands like Ballpoint and Boredom and No S. Wonder. Huh? S. Bowley. Yeah. And, and it <coughs> Crafter. Was, it was yeah. like, how can we get famous? No, who gives a fuck? We're just making cool tunes. Um, especially Boredom. Like, the, you know, um, Simon Lee, rest in peace, the singer. Actually, that's one of the dudes I was thinking about when it comes to mental issues and getting into a, a drama or a death. Um, those dudes just lived it hard and they bodyboarded like demons and they weren't doing it because they were like, oh, we're going to be on tour and famous. It was just like, this is just what we do. And I love that side of the music scene when you, you're you willing to put that much effort into it and the reward at the gig that you do is you get to share a jug with, yeah. the, with the four other dudes in your band and that's your fee. 
<laughs> yeah. That was our fee for playing gigs at the White Sands, one jug. I think yeah. jugs were still 12 bucks then. So I love yeah. that. Yeah. Parkway Drive, just, I saw a lot of um, tributes to them recently because it was 20 years since they made their That's wild. Like, debut years. or whatever and, and Crafter <clears> was paying tribute to how he got to play with them. Yeah. Um, their example of like the scene growing them. True. And then- yeah, hardcore bands are seen. Even yeah. if they get big, they still – there's very few – like you can't be a corporate hardcore band, I don't think, because the – the, the foundations of that lifestyle and the mindset you've got to be to be involved in that world, you, you can't just be a record company guy. Like you've got to be – it's all about supporting the other guys in that scene and the other bands and everyone helping each other up and, you know, I love that. That's so important. Do you – um? it seems like you've worked out life pretty early, but I know a lot of people – this is just my opinion. Like I don't think you ever make it in life. Like a lot of people have this – vision sipping cocktails on the beach and they're rich and they've just got no problems. Like, mm. And as you get older, you kind of realise that that's never going to happen. Like you're always going to have a kid pestering you for something. Or <laughs> 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 yeah, but at what age and did you kind of work that out? I, f- I had this problem where I never feel like I'm living. Like I, ha- I feel like I'm always working towards a point where I am truly living how I want to live. And then I worked out that that doesn't exist. So I had to be realistic about life goals and realistic about putting energy into enjoying the moment rather than thinking of the next best thing. And my ex used to cuss me on this all the time and say, you're never happy with your lot. And that's like, because I want the next thing and I want the better one and I want the bigger one. And then I was like, I don't fucking need all these things. I think it was when I was 40. I felt like 40, turning 40 was a real big uh, switch in that. And I was lucky enough to have had like f- nearly maybe 12 or 13 good years of pendulum, of touring. And I got super zen. I was just like chilled out, like on that thirst. Still had it, but I just wasn't letting it control my life. And I was being really thankful. Actually, when you talk about your breathing work, something like that came into play with me around that time. I would go to bed and I would lay in bed and I would just literally say like these positive affirmations in my mind of like how grateful I was that I was in a warm, safe place. So just super basic things. And I was like, I'm in bed, it's clean and warm and I haven't had a heart attack <laughs> and I've, you know, I've got gigs lined up, I've got work, I live in a house, just the most menial things. And it just made me feel so good every night and I'd fall asleep straight away smiling. Yeah. And that was 40. And, uh, you know, that uh, that was the turning point. And I was very lucky because, fuck, I shouldn't say lucky. I always say lucky, but I worked my ring off to get to where we got to. So it was was a lot of hard work, but a lot of, you know, a lot of um, things happened that were good, that that allowed me to live the lifestyle I was leaving. But... I got to about 40 and I was just like, just be grateful for everything that's going on. Stop thinking that what you've got isn't good enough. There's nothing wrong with having goals and having aspirations and trying to work towards better things, but I don't necessarily let it consume me. And when I when I realized that a lot of material things that I was looking at that other people had weren't that important to me, it really made me feel better about my lot and where I was. Yeah. And then all your friends start to die <laughs> and you're like, everything's wicked. I'm <laughs> still here. I think that helped a lot. Imagine, so you experienced that at 40. So yeah. you've got, say you live to 100, you've got 60 more years of that Insane. knowledge and enjoyment of knowing you should enjoy this moment. But yeah. picture the people that get to 80 <clears throat> or their deathbed and they never work that out. They were still their whole life just looking too far forward and never – enjoy themselves well, where think, they were. I think a lot of people get to retirement age and then turn around and go, why the fuck did I do that? Yeah. Why did I just work for 40 years at some job that like wasn't fulfilling because I was worried about taking the risk of doing what I really wanted to do or you know, I didn't want to stop paying the bills. And COVID really put that into a perspective as well, having that taken away. When you get to your zen happy place at 40 and then at 44 it's like bumping the road that's all gone and you're like oh man I'm going to start again Uh, I feel even more zen now about it like uh, I think just having having things in your life that are so simple and so easily achievable like literally going for a surf or going for a walk or just the dumbest things and and really uh, thinking about them in a positive way rather than just something that you take for granted yeah that helped a lot 
Like it's like a spiritual awareness, eh? Hey? Yeah, like even just going bush. Like my grandmother lives out in Ben Carbon where my family had a farm. And I'll go out there and just drive to a you know a rocky outcrop and just sit there, turn the motor off and just trip out on Western Australia. And I'm like, like this is just the most basicest thing. But because I had that because I couldn't do that for so long, now I appreciate that so much. And little things like that are really getting me through all of the all of the nonsense of life. So you know what trips me out all the time. It might be hard to articulate, but the um I always think back to like you see like advancement in technology or you're in like a busy city or this, but then say you go down south to the to the Margaret River or somewhere and you go on a beach no one's on and you, the waves are pumping and you get that pure sort of stoke of something you love doing. I always think about if you capture a photo, like we're so advanced, you take photos of like technology in the cities, but if you take a photo of that same wave all the time, it's stuck in a time warp where you don't even know what the date on that photo would be. Mm. You know what I mean? Always <laughs> yeah. think about like we, we get so advanced, but the simplest things in life are like the purest, like being nature and I don't know, it's weird. The more we grow, the more we forget some stuff just stays the exact same. Yeah. Something pure about that, eh? Like, this perspective it's as well, like in a way. I'll go travel and I'll go to some of the big cities you're talking about and I'll come home and I'll go down south and then there's someone who lives in this paradise who's complaining about something that's changing that's the smallest change in my eyes that's everything to them. Like they're going to build a new thing. It's going to ruin the world. Yeah. And I'm like I could pull up photos I took of Ingie Point smoking in 1995 stand in that same spot, hold the photo, I'm like, it looks exactly the same. Exactly, yeah. Yet I was just in town and there's a greenie going mental, they're building a something and I'm like, it's just perspective, man. Yeah, do you ever think about that? Like, Yeah, yeah, big time. Everything, all the noise, but they, these things that just go like quietly about their business every day, like Budj or something, like you look at the ocean there, yeah, if you would, despite the technology of the camera, you wouldn't know what what year it was. It could be 1921. Yeah. And those waves are breaking the same in 2023, you know? Yeah. Well, lately it's when I've been going down out. south, I've had my new girl with me and I've been surfing at Huzzers. And she's with like- the rest of Western Australia? With the Groms. <laughs> and I'm sat there and I'm like, I'm 12 again. I'm yeah. 46 and I'm 12 and nothing has changed. I'm still stoked. You get certain feelings that evokes mm. that sort of tingling. Yeah. Someone said, you're going to paddle out to South Point? I said, I don't think I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mom's picking me up. <laughs> I was like, I'm 12 again. This rules. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just perspective, man. Having everything taken away a few times in your life definitely puts you into a, a good headspace when you start to rebuild, do especially you, if you have success at it. Do you yeah. ever like with that perspective sort of pinch yourself still? Like I know watching some of your videos a few months ago, you were in Belgium or you were following the festival. Yeah tour in Europe and I'll, some of the crowds man look like there was fucking like hundreds of thousands of people in mm. like a part and you're standing there like with that view do you yeah. ever still just trip out that you're this guy from Padbury and Scarborough and Perth that <laughs> worked at a bottle shop got into music you know there's people that don't trip out on that yeah. that like come from Los Angeles or wherever and they're just used to that and they're like they come from a culture where uh, achieving that kind of fame and notoriety is, is everywhere you look but then I think that there's Perth and that is a completely different thing. And anyone who achieves that from Perth, like us, I'm like, I trip out on it. For, tw <laughs> for 20 years, I trip out on so it. So you still trip? Still trip, yeah. yeah. I still I still stand there and I, 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 I laugh a lot while I'm DJing. I'm like like a childish giggle of like, <laughs> look at this shit. I'm fucking some donut from Scarborough. Like, I'm renting it. You know, 17,000 people in one room there was at that gig you're talking about. That one was great. There was another yeah. one you did it was fucking nuts as well. The one where they suspended us from the ceiling and I was on this like, you know, this – uh, it was like a DJ platform that had chains that went up to the roof and then it went over the crowd. Rihanna, Super Bowl yeah, style? Pink. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, stra strap me up, Tommy Lee style, and we fly over the crowd, no worries. That's but I'll be giggling going, I'm from Scarborough. <laughs> With your BMX bike? <laughs> yeah. Cussing yeah, all that's, my That's cussing all my mindfulness though, right? Like yeah, being, I think it's good. If you come from, this is another thing that, that harks back to talking about scene. If you come from a scene where, you know, there's other bands and you're all equals and then suddenly your next project blows up like that and you're touring the world, uh, some people forget that and they just become a bit dickish about it and they're like, oh, I deserve this. And But even after all this time and selling all these records and playing all these gigs, I'm still like, I'm still overly grateful for it, like a lot more than a lot of people. I, th I think the Yanks are really like not – I find that they they gush about it like I'm so I'm so grateful we're here I love you guys I'm just like this is just grooming they're just being told to be like that and be humble but it's hard there was one thing I used to always say you can't have an ego if you grew up in WA 
because everyone in WA wants to cut that shit in half and make you <laughs> just exactly how you were before you left. Yeah. And they keep you in check. And, you know, historically, like I never really, like I've got a personal Facebook account that I used to just keep up with mates and stuff. And those are the sort of dudes that be like, yeah, you're not that good. <laughs> it doesn't matter what we'd achieve. They still come up with that. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm from WA. I, f- I don't forget. <laughs> and it's harsh, but it's uh, that harshness that we grew up with here has really helped us forge our career because the amount of uh, – the amount of attackers and invaders that you have to fend off in the music industry and I'm just like, we're from Perth, get fucked, and we just win, you know, whereas a lot of people are just crumble. So there's a definite harshness about it, <laughs> but it also makes you very grateful. Yeah. What about like, artists like you reckon Ed Sheeran and like Harry Styles and those guys that mm. are just were travelling Australia recently and doing like 90,000 people, yeah. 80,000 people back-to-back nights. Do you reckon they get the stage on a world tour where you, you're just fucking numb to it and you go out and you're like, oh, God, another day. Did you have you ever spoken to artists that have done those sort of tours? Yeah. So I reckon it wouldn't be – you wouldn't be human if you didn't get cooked after a while performing, but then I think it depends it's not on normal sp- to be playing in front of that many people day in, day out, so I don't even know what that emotions they would be going through. Eventually, though, it just becomes the, the norm shit. for them, hey? They get annoying, I reckon. Yeah, do you I reckon think, they would be cooked by the end of it? They would well, be, Well, if we're talking about Ed Sheeran specifically, I lived in Finsbury Park in North London and so did he. So I used to see him down Blackstock Road where his flat was. I remember going to this like music conference for managers and our manager won an award and he came over and like congratulated us all and said, love your music, so cool to hang out. This is like early days of when he was on, on his upward swing. And he was still playing like little gigs in clubs and pubs and stuff. And then next minute he's doing 90,000 in Perth, you know, more than the footy gets, <laughs> which is mental. I reckon that would be cool, but you'd probably think, I wish I could just play to a small crew like – It'd be nice, but it would depend on schedule as well. If they hammer you and you're just doing weekend after weekend after weekend of shows that size, you wouldn't even know where you were, I don't think. Mm. They're getting private jets everywhere. They're not checking in at airports. It's like it's, it all depends on how your team around you sort of works it for you in your favour. And if they drill you like a commodity, which is how a lot of people go through it, you'll burn out. So do they like – have a say in their tour? Would they sit down with their tour manager and go, look, I want to have, we're going to Sydney, I want to have two days off to go see shit? Or do they, are they fully detached from it and they just look at it and go, oh, yeah, whatever? Well, you can do that, but you've got to do it in advance. Yeah. So if you've got to say, if, you, if you're invested into your movements, you can do that. But a lot of people are just too busy making the art to think about that. And then when it comes time to go to Sydney, they're like, we've got to go to Melbourne straight away after the show, like off stage, onto the jet, off we go. And you're like, oh, oh, shit. Like, I wanted to go to see the Harbour Bridge and like, we don't have time. If you had have been invested in it when they booked it, you could have done that. But a lot of people don't. And I've been doing all of my own travel forever. So I, I, I never had that happen. But then again, I'm not Ed Sheeran. So I don't have to worry too yeah. much about that. Have you seen the price of them private jets? How much it costs? Uh, in Australia, it's probably the most expensive on earth actually. Yeah. I heard Sharp talking about from America to England was 170,000. Oh, you can't go over the ocean. Yeah. Little ocean hops, yeah, fine. <laughs> but if you go over the Atlantic or over the sea, anywhere to go from continent to continent, bend over. Yeah. yeah. We used to take them from London to Spain and it was maybe 10 grand return. Uh, and to some people that is a bargain if they're earning crazy money because you sidestep the immigration, pilots wait, like they'll just chill. When it's time, when you want to go, they'll be like, yeah, we'll go, Yeah, which is, which is mad. I caught a private jet. I, I stowed away on one. Uh, I was in Russia playing this festival and uh, Martin Garrix was playing before us, who's now like fucking biggest DJ in the world. And we were talking to him literally while his last tune's ending and I'm getting ready for my first one. I was just saying how bad the journey was to get there. We're out in this field in this place called Nichny Novograd and you had to take three planes to get there and it's piss and rain. And he said, well, where are you going after this? I said, oh, we're going to Amsterdam. He's like, oh, that's where I'm from because he's Dutch. He said, oh... We're going to Tomorrowland in Belgium. Why don't you jump in the plane with us? And I was like, just jump in the plane <laughs> casually, like, yeah. Uh, long story short, we jumped, in, we jumped in the plane, me and this other group, a bunch of boys called Noisier, sort of stowed away on his plane, got a ride. They dropped us off. Everything was amazing. And then when I got home, I priced how much that one-way flight was and it was 50 grand. Yeah. <laughs> 50 grand to go from the boonies of Russia, somewhere in between St. Petersburg and Moscow, 
to uh, back to Belgium and then on to Amsterdam, fifty thousand dollars for that Far one flight. But it makes no difference to him, eh? He's already bought Bro, the flight. His logo yeah. was on the tail of the plane. Fucking hell! He didn't just rent it for that trip. He had it for the summer. That's the best Uber share. Right? Yeah, that's what they reckon the big dogs do. They buy the like, plane, yeah. like say Rogan, I'm guessing, has his private jets, and then when he's not using it, he's just having it leased out. So oh, it's for sure, just like making that. money in America. You can buy um, shares into like credits on pl- uh, private jet legs and you just stay connected to this matrix of like where you need to go and where they fly and they'll say Atlanta to Miami one seat spare this much and I've done a couple of those and that was really in America it makes a lot of sense you can yeah. jump on for two grand or whatever and you know if you need to get somewhere quick and you don't want to go through the rigmarole of flying through a major airport and you, you know that's not that's not not a bad thing, but in Australia, there's no chance. Everyone's just so expensive. Way more money in America as well. They do, like, yeah. Money surrounded by money, like it's fuck. It's another level. It's hard to comprehend until you're there and you hear. It's just it's fucking everywhere. I mean, like, I trip out on how a lot of poor people, but if you make it, yeah, they rub shoulders with blokes, and then there's doors open, and it's just crazy for networking. And they even. floss though. If, <laughs> I've no, I've noticed there's been a change in Australian culture, which is people flexing bullshit money, especially in WA, like. I've been gone for so long. I'm used to people kind of underplaying it. Like you don't want people to know, you don't want to play all your, 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 your cards. Mm. And now it's like, no, fuck that. I'm going to buy this block for $2 million on West Coast Drive, put a $5 million house on it, and then park 16 G-Wagons out the front. And I'm like, <laughs> who are you people? Because yeah. the amount of wealth in Western Australia has really spun me out. You know, when you see people paying $2 million in West Oz for a, a house on 400 squares, yeah. because it's a cool suburb like Mount Hawthorne or whatever. I'm like, how do these people get this money? Yeah. <laughs> like I thought we did good and I'm like, yeah, I could not ever afford that. But uh, the, the the disgusting levels of wealth here is just spinning me out because it feels like America now. Yeah, like mining, f- mining. like the Everyone big- says mining and I'm like, I don't know any mining people that own that, that, own that much money yeah. working unless they're corporate sort of big top dogs. tier level people. But how many of them is there? Yeah. Like if you cruise around – do the, the Cottesloe run, go down Sterling Highway, Dalkeith, Netherlands, where all that old money is. It feels like it's just got lots more of that. Like there was those areas before, but now, you know, it's not uncommon to head up north of Perth up to Mindari or Quinns and someone have a house that's looking over the beach that's like two million bucks. Mm. I'm like, where'd that come from? I don't remember that. A lot of over East crew buying though. Mm, I, I, I get that. I'd want to live I here. A lot of inheritance too. Yeah, yeah like like generational money as well. Yeah. I wish I had generational money. <laughs> yeah. It'd be great. My mum gave me a $1,600 Kingswood when I was 18 and then said, <laughs> now piss off. So yeah, it's yeah. probably, you could have been generational wealth. It's probably worth well, a that, shit ton now. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I just bought a Kingswood actually. Yeah. Yeah, funny. Yeah. And it didn't cost 1600 bucks. I'll tell you that one. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a different thing because I think London as well, London really drilled it into me to like underplay your status. Don't flex. We don't, you don't wear extravagant things. Like you... Like I remember going around to a mate's house and him and his wife had done exceptionally well. She was from a Chinese family, so they'd all kicked in for this house. And I said, never bring anyone here, especially from the music world, because they'll fucking hate you. Mm. He's like, why? And I was like, you've got a four by three with a 60-foot garden, a studio down the back, like a full house that's three stories high in London. That's just not achievable for (laughs) 99% of the people that we know. And he was like, I never thought of it like that. And I was like, you can't flex over there. You don't want unwanted heat either. Yeah. Whereas here it's like people like turn up the fire. I'm going to, you know, I just see a, I see a lot of like tragically bad high end fashion in Perth. Like mum's (laughs) rolling on the school run with those, disgusting Gucci shoes that are $600 and I'm like, oh, you're repulsive. Yeah. Probably from Bali. Well, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. That's the, even worse. The you know, bags, like the designer, yeah. like fake Versace or Gucci. The thing is, if you if you adorn yourself in Chanel and Louis V, who's going to believe it's real anyway? But do you know what the weird flex is in America with the um, the tech flex where it's like you go, they go out of their way to wear like clothes like Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> like that's also a weird flex now. That everyone knows balance. how rich they are. Yeah, yeah those dad the new Stephen balance. Jobs. <laughs> those are cool suddenly. When your missus shows you a TikTok or an Instagram or something, he says, I want to buy these big buffy sneakers. You're just like, you got sucked into that one, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> the white MG's gone f- as of today. I saw from, an one was there, right? From The Verge. Yeah. I got sent photos yesterday from yeah. Ben. Is that? He was s- standing at the car. I think it might have sold. 
That's amazing. We've been crank calling um, many a random person. What people who are selling cars? Yeah, because their numbers on the side. So he he called. Uh, oh, they put the number on the car. Yeah, so private so, sale. So mm. would have called up saying a, a blind kid like crashed into the car. Walked into it. So mean. <laughs> <laughs> but we had this one last week where we called um, a do- mobile dog washer uh-huh. and um, we pretended we started off with a dog but it was clearly a quokka and was seeing mm-hmm. if she'd wash a quokka. Wash you down? She was unbelievable. One of the best ones we ever had. She was <clears> so nice. And so many people were frothing. So now we're thinking <laughs> we're going to try it double down on her. Oh, same chick. The quokka washer. And I'm thinking maybe I got caught and I'm in jail and Buddha or yourself, I don't know if you're up for crank calls, someone can call as my lawyer saying- Crank calls are not me. I'll, <laughs> I'll start laughing straight away. I'm the worst. All right, Buddha's the lawyer then. He calls her and says um, that basically Rufus is in jail and he's got one phone call and he wants to call you and then you connect me to her and then I'll just see where it goes. So I'm, I'm the lawyer. You're the lawyer you're representing my, Rufus. What's my name, Paul Hardy? For sure. <laughs> what lawyers am I? You're SMG very good on the spot. You'll, yeah, yeah, you'll yeah. find it. Let's hope she answers anyway. What's the prison called? Casuarino? Is that the prison? Hello. Hi, is this a vet? Yeah, speaking. Hi, vet. This is Paul Harding from S&G Law Firm. How are you today? Yeah, not bad, thanks. Oh, that's good. I just have a client with me at the moment, Rufus, um, and he mentioned that he... Um, we might have spoken to you last week as a close confidant in terms of some um, pet grooming for a majestic animal he had, one of his yeah. pets. Um, and he's he is currently just in lockup at the moment, but he oh, had no. one. He's had a phone call and he just thought he had a really good chat with you, and he just wanted you to be his one call. Would you be willing to just have a bit of a chat with him in terms of some pet grooming and? Just about to have a chat with him. He's been pretty restless and upset this morning. He wants to speak to someone. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, okay. okay. Fantastic. I, I, I really, I'm not a relative or anything. I, I don't even know who it is. It was just a gentleman that rang me. Yeah, no, no, anyway. I understand that. He said you guys had a really nice chat and you just had a really good demeanour about yourself. So I, I'm just passing on the message from the prison guard and um, – Oh, Obviously, I represent Jesus. him. So, I'm so sorry. oh, that's okay. He's a lovely gentleman, and um, you seem like a lovely yeah. lady. So, would you be happy to have a chat with him at all? He's got about three minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine because I'm actually doing a job at the moment. Oh, so, no yeah, worries. that's fine. Thank you. No so, I'll, I'll, I'll pass him on. Hang on, I'll just let the. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. You can take the cuffs off. Hang on. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Oh, hi, Vet. Oh, yeah, I've, I've stuffed up here. Um, Is this with what you were asking me? Yeah, the other so, way? so, but yeah. I they, wanted they, you to ring back so I'd said don't do it because I, when it all came to my head, like I, it all sort of worked out, I'm thinking, no, someone's going to dob you in. Yeah. And I wanted you to, like, hands, you know, just even, I'm sorry. Yeah, anyway, well, you do the talking. Yeah, you they, do the talking. They, they got me red-handed with um, with Quavo, but it's kind of, could be even, it could be worse. So they've got me on one count, which they say I'm facing two years and $10,000 $10, fine, but I'm just real stressed because, like, I'm just going to whisper a bit, but the other nine are still at my mum's house. And um, if you, oh. if if my lawyer can give you the address, I'm wondering, because if they get them, that's I'll be life in prison. So, um, what I can't yeah. do that. Well, I just need someone to just to get rid of them. Like, if, haven't you got a close friend? You're my friend, Yvette. Um, I can't do it. I well, can't. I can't. Kwale, Qu- Kwale, he, he in his Hawaiian shirt. Yeah, you got three minutes. I can't do it, love. I'm so sorry. Is there someone else? In, in his shirt. Huh? In his pocket. There's. I, f- I feared this day would come, and I've written down what to do with him and where to take him. And they, some, I, I've never eaten them, but a few people have eaten them. They've said they, they taste good. But you do what you got to do. You just get them nine out of there and you'll save me a lot of money. I, I can't do it. If I you can't. Just get to, uh, get to the note in the pocket. Oh, fuck. Where? Where? 
uh, my lawyer, I'll put him back on. He'll give you the address. And, yeah, if you can just get him out of there. Mum can't, mum can't even see properly. She's still... I can't do this. I'm just a bloody old lady that doesn't know bitty squat from her asshole. Yeah, but they. I'm, I just fear they, they're going to work out my mum's address. They're going to check the property and she can't get rid of them. She can't even see. But if, if you could just do this one thing, if you could. When did you get, when did this happen to you? They got me last night with Kuala. I was, I was stupid. I was parading him out the front of my house. I had his. What the fuck? I, but, but luckily the other nine weren't there. So, yeah. All right, I'll speak to your lawyer, but is there anything else you need? I'm going to put you on to my lawyer. Here he is. Okay. Sorry, mate. Hey, Yvette, how are you? Oh, uh, right. you're, no, you're all right. No, you're an absolute scholar. Um, look, between you and I, he's left the room. Now, he's not all there. He's um, He's been, yeah, sniffing. I think we've. what happened was we found him at his house and he's just been living amongst a lot of mould and... Um, <laughs> He, yeah, I don't think he's a bit, bit rare. So, I think it's just nice to entertain, nice to chat with him. But long story short, like he, he'll be right. The quackers are going to be fine. We're gonna, we're gonna take him to Garden Island, I think. Yeah. And then but, see how it goes. But, are you okay? Yeah, it's just been emotional. But I think we'll get through it. He's all right. Just been a bit lime slept much. He said that. Situation is, you were his lawyer. He got busted last night. What time? Uh, I couldn't tell you. I think last I heard it was about ten o'clock. But he's gonna be oh. fine. I think we're gonna get him off on bail. So I think he just wanted to have a chat with you because he thought you're a lovely lady doing a great job with animals. He's a big animal lover. But, but I think he's just a bit. He's gone a bit wild. Like he's living around a lot of mold. We found like feces in his house. It was his, and he's just rare. He's a rare unit. He sounds normal. Like, apart from what's happened, he sounds... Be surprised. Okay. But, but he, you've been lovely. Like, I think he just wanted to have a good chat with you. He's going to be okay. We're going to get the quackers back to Garden Island or Rottnest or wherever they're from. Yeah, that's fine. Quavo's that's actually got a gig with Disney to, Channel. Because, like, I was, like, sort of not with it. I was understanding there were dogs. And then when the situation happened about what I mean, was washing them, I was like, um, I don't know if I'm saying too much. I said I can't do it because I'm gonna crazy. And then when it all hit me after I hung up, like an hour later, I'm like, no, I hope he brings me back because it was no ID, a uh, call ID. And then I said, I hope he brings me back because he needs to put them back in their natural habitat. Yeah. Like that, well, you have know? you have you ever heard of um, Pendulum, the band Pendulum? Yeah. Yeah, they're a big band. Um, well, they've actually agreed to take a couple of quackers on tour with them. So um, they're, it's going to be fantastic. They've got an agreement with um, Sony Music and the quackers, were gonna, some of them are going to go to Europe and tour okay, with the band. Do that, though? Apparently, yeah. Legally? Um, Without, well, you know. the Swiss government paid quite a bit for three of them, a big for tourism, and Pendulum are going to do a huge tour. So El Horner, one of their guys... It was a massive quack. I know, it's wild. But, yeah, but he, so... Uh, he said that he was going to give me... You were going to give me an address to do something, but... I, yeah, I reckon yeah. now he's just... He's gone a bit crazy, that guy. So, don't worry about it. You, you've done fantastic. We're going to look after him. I think you keep doing what you're doing. And I think the main thing was he just wanted to get... Have a chat and vent a bit. But he's all good, and I reckon he'll be able to lock up in a couple of days or a year or so. Oh, God. He's not going to go full term, is he? What, you reckon in a couple of days he might be all right? Yeah, yeah, I reckon day or two. It's his uh, first offence. We did find a couple of guinea pigs, but that was minor. But first offence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you look after yourself. All is well. And thank you so much for everything. And good luck with your business. Can you just, I don't know, just, just let him know that, oh, far out. I don't know. I want to be his sister or his best friend, you know, but I just... <laughs> This is just out of my head. I haven't got a good friend. I do, but you know what I mean? I just, this blows my brain. I yeah, just, nah, we're all the I same. We're all the same, boy. Yeah. No, but he I, will be. It's all right. You're, you're fine. Honestly, you're busy enough as no, it is. He'll be right. If, if there's anything I can do, but I, I just can't do anything that's, you know, left to centre because I just, I just haven't got 
the strength and the um, yeah, the, you know what I mean. Oh the, no, I agree. Do it. I mean, if it was life and death, bloody oath. But I just don't know. Oh, of course, no. Yeah, I don't even know how I got to be his lawyer. To be honest, like he's not paying me, but the the, <sighs> the prison just give him. But he, he's all good anyway. I've got to go, but you uh, uh, you look after yourself. Yeah, You've been I will. Fantastic. And can you look after him? Yeah, I will definitely. Please. No Thank worries. You. All right, take care. Thank bye. You. Bye. Bye. Oh my god! That is my spirit animal. I, feel so- I think she's. You've just sent her around the toilet. <laughs> oh shit! Oh, she said no, I'm an old lady and I'm not. My brain's cooked. Oh no! I was like, oh my god, my heart broke. Oh, Dude, I felt bad. I feel like, but then I felt like, did we get it? Okay. Then. I'm gonna call her back off air and I'm just gonna like tell her, like, look, they let me out. I'm free. Yeah. I thought you were gonna say you're gonna call her and tell her it was a prank. Yeah. No, she's think- too invested. She's yeah, too invested. She's the fact that she said she was hoping that you would call back. Yeah. We've we've heard um we've Which had this before with people that we've pranked and when you come clean that it's a crank call. They get angry. Yeah, yeah they, right. they get fucking you gotta yeah. be cruel to be kind, I think. Oh, I was gonna say all good got out. Yeah, I'll say Got just back go, on my meds. Just go to I realised I was being a bit weird. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's some of the. I, I was uncontrollably laughing at one yeah, point. I, it in, bro. I was crying up. Then I was like, felt guilty when she started like pouring her own emotions out. Oh, I loved how you just threw El Horne under Thanks. the bus. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah, big fan. Got all their records. <laughs> Gonna burn them now. <laughs> you fucking quacker stealer. No, she's lovely. She wouldn't burn anything. Eh? Yeah, that's not a bad idea actually. With all these uh, celebs that come over to Rotto and take selfies with quackers, I'll just take one with me. Yeah, well you know. <laughs> Yeah. Steve Oki throws a cake. Imagine yeah, throwing a quack throwing under the cross. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, can I get that back? I've only got one. <laughs> no, you just got no one. Claws him. <laughs> just crowd surfing through Tomorrowland. Yeah, I think I found a, because um, I was uncontrollably laughing and I couldn't talk, but I, I don't know if it's an, a physical loophole, but I think if you whisper, it stops the laugh reflex. Oh, I started Because I started oh, whispering. I started crying. I started crying. <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer's <laughs> crying. Because <laughs> I was <laughs> just really emotional. I was like <laughs> laughing so much, so, but I didn't want to break it in full, so I was like... <laughs> Crying, laughing, and I fully acknowledge yeah, and expect every <laughs> single person that heard that phone call right now thinks all three of us are assholes, yeah. and I 100 percent agree. I feel so bad about. I this. wasn't on the phone. I'm just yeah, watching. Yeah, 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 but you're yeah. an asshole by association. <laughs> I'm an asshole because brought you in. I'm an asshole because that asshole dropped me into <laughs> yeah, it. You've been brought in. <laughs> She's gonna look up my Instagram now and be like, "Look, <laughs> no, but you're gonna call her." Yeah, but I, I just. Um, that's the epitome of a crank call gone wrong. Like oh, it went from yeah. the funniest thing I've ever heard. To sad. I mean, it would have like, been better if she just started abusing you, to be honest. Yeah, but I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> no, but that'd be man. fine. I'd be like, I can oh, deal yeah, with being yeah. called names, but she's like invested. Why well, do you brought me in? I thought it was a funny it. idea. I, I didn't know we were going to have the world's nicest human trying to, like, she was going to do it. She Dude, was going to, like, point, I don't know if she was going to eat him, but she was going to. No, she, she wants to be a sister. And at one point when it was getting real heavy, <laughs> I thought, she, yeah, she was going around the streets. I was like, don't have a heart attack or anything with the street. You dudes are mean. She's at someone's house with a half lathered doll. Yeah, standing she's standing there going, I can't do this. She's lovely. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why I was trying to be nice to her. Yeah, like, like, I want to call back right now. I can't sit, man. I feel so bad. No, no, let her finish the dog. Nah, she needs to know. Don't tell us a prank. No, I'm just going to tell her I'm out. And no, um, you can't. You're not out yet. You only just yeah, got off the phone. Let you out. Yeah, call it. I'm going to after business hours. No, I, I can't let it rest. Just say you've got like community service and all as well, and you're getting rid of the mold. She probably won't answer now. Hello. Oh, hello, Vet. It's Rufus again. Hi, Rufus. Oh, I don't know what you said or to my lawyer or what how it happened, but great news. Yeah. They, they've let me go for now and um, I'm out of lockup. So thank you so much. And um, I'm off my home, on my way home now. So I'm going to sort it all out. And all I have to do is um, I've got a little court appearance, but they think I'm just going to have to do some community service. Oh, fantastic. I'm so glad. Yeah. I'm so thankful. Oh Thanks for taking my calls. And, um, I really uh, appreciate it. You sound like the best human ever. Look, I I, I don't know. (laughs) I just wanted you to, like, you need to, if you got extra, you need to get rid of them. You really do. You know, I I can't do anything. I don't know. They said, the guy said that he's actually sorted it all out with them all, but I don't know what he meant, whether he knows anything or... 
This is so you don't have to tell me anything. That's fine. This is such a great life lesson, and um, I really appreciate there's such nice people like you in this world. And I just want to thank yeah. you. And um, yeah, you probably won't hear from me again, but just know that okay. you've got a friend in Rufus forever. Okay, thank you so much. You're a sweetheart. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, love. Have a good one. You All too. the best. Bye. Yeah, you can ring me if you need to. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. 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 Yes. Oh, I got the full circle Oh, I feel closer. I can live again. <laughs> Welcome to my guest, Paul Hardy. <laughs> oh, that's the gnarliest crank call I've ever done in my life. Because normally, like, they get angry and you can you can pick a bit of them and hate them, but there was just nothing to hate with no, that. Too nice. Do you know, I reckon these sort of moments will come full circle? Like, there's going to be a nice sliding door moment where Snowbell swallows a foreign object. <laughs> <laughs> she comes over. Where does this woman work? Do you know? Oh, she's not a vet, though. I keep thinking of her. She actually just washes them, mate. Yeah, yeah. So she's like a mobile dog washer. Yeah. I feel like you should plump her business up, but then again, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm at a happy place with that now that she's she's yeah. got closure and she's like she probably in a week or so will be laughing about that. <laughs>